Hi everyone, my name is Erin Buchanan and I'm here today to talk to you about adaptive ag algorithms for stimuli sampling and cognitive studies. Now this project is part of a um, collaboration with the Psychological Science Accelerator. So the PSA is a CERN for Psychological Science. It's a set of globally distributed researchers in, with more than a thousand members in 82 different countries. And essentially these researchers commit to open science principles and practices to help collect data, translate, do methods for democratically selected studies. One of those democratically selected studies is a project I'm gonna to talk to you about today, which is the Semantic Priming Across Many Languages Project or the SPAM-L. Now, the SPAM-L has inspired our talk today, but first a little bit about semantic priming. Semantic priming has a rich history in cognitive psychology, wherein it occurs when a response latency, how fast someone can respond to something, is facilitated, meaning moves faster, for word pairs that are related over word pairs that are unrelated. So you're much faster to answer a question about dog cat than you are about dog spoon because dog cat is related and dog spoon is not related. <clears throat> it's usually measured with what a lexical decision task where participants are asked to say, is this word or is this not a word or a naming task where you simply read a word aloud. And it's the second word <laughs> that is facilitated meaning sped up. So faster times. Well, the Semantic Priming Project was a large scale project by Keith Hutchinson et al. to provide these priming values for 661 pairs, word pairs, um, two sets of them. So it's a great start. If we look at the data from that project, the items are considerably variable. And the current sample sizes within that project may not tell us the true population scores. And if we look here at our violin plots, what we see is that it's relatively the same for two different stimulus onset asynchronies, so how fast the prime word occurred, and um, the type of relationship, either a first associate or an other associate. This y-axis is a z-score, and what we see is there's just a slight amount of priming, but a big distribution. Now, the other key problem with this project is that it's only in English. Well, what the SPAM-L wants to achieve is a couple of things. First, we wanna provide this online framework to collect response latencies. And that's been shown to, to be a thing from projects like Spilex. And we're modeling this after the success of the Small World of Words project. Okay. We're going to produce a large multilinguistic semantic priming data set in up to 44 different languages, complete with other cognitive variables that people are interested in, like age of acquisition, familiarity, concreteness, and imageability. We'll also provide computational packages, which I know Skip is excited about, for researchers to help explore and use the data set, modeled after the really fantastic LexOps by Jack Taylor. Those are our lofty goals. But you can learn more by watching a video that occurred way too early in the morning where I talk about this project. We're also um, accepting collaborators, especially for data collection and translation. To get started doing that, simply send me an email. But I'm here today to talk to you about what we're doing in this project, which is the adaptive algorithm part of the sampling. <clears throat> we want to create this big data set, right? But participant attention, especially online, is a finite resource. So let's collect a bunch of data, take a large set of stimuli. And if you're going to watch my talk at Psychonomics, I'll tell you how we came up with the stimuli and just sample. So each participant only sees a smaller subset of the available, larger available data set. But then the question becomes, do we really need the same number of participants on every stimulus? Or are some stimuli better than others? And we know quicker that what they are. So to answer that question, we're gonna use what's called accuracy and parameter estimation. Now, APE is a way to really design for power, but it allows you to selectively sample or adaptively sample your stimuli sets. 
So what you do is you sample until the confidence interval of a data set is sufficiently narrow. I'm sorry, the confidence interval of a parameter is sufficiently narrow. Okay. It's a multi-step procedure where you define a minimum acceptable sample size, a stopping rule where data collection is no longer necessary, and a maximum sample size. This is mostly from the work of Ken Kelly. So let me show you how that worked for our project. So we had to come up with this idea of sufficiently narrow. What is an accurately measured response latency? Well, thankfully, there's a ton of data to look at. So the English Lexicon Project is a lexical decision and naming response latency data set for many words, especially a lot of weird words. So simple words to very complex words. Like the first one in this example here, philosophical, right? But it provides us a really good metric for what is a response latency base. So we defined our stopping rule, like when is this sufficiently narrow, the confidence interval on the response latency, by, um, by saying this confidence interval should be small. Well, what is small? Like, how do we define that? <clears throat> so we're looking at this old data and we can determine what small might be. And so what's the average standard error for standardized response latencies? Well, if you calculate those from the English Lexicon project, it's about uh, 0.16 is our standard error. Okay, with the, the, and this is a, a distribution of the standard errors for each item. All right, so 0.16. How many people do I need to get a sample size or a, a confidence interval where the standard error is 0.16? So the confidence interval will be about two, two times 0.16 on each side, right? Well, if I assume this data to be representative and I randomly sample it with sample sizes ranging from five to 200, when would I hit that point for most of the stimuli? Well, it's about 25. Maybe that's not quite enough, um, but about 80% of the samples will hit that sufficiently narrow window with a sample size of about 25. So I could probably pick that as my minimum sample size. Now the maximum sample size is a little bit harder. There are many ways to do this. You could simply say my time, I only have two semesters to do this, my money <laughs> or my effort. Okay, I'm over this project, which happens quite a lot. Or I could use a larger power criteria. I could say, well, 90% of the samples will meet at 35 and 95% will meet at 50. Okay, And you need this maximum rule so you don't do have a point at which to stop. What we did was we actually used the semantic priming project data as a metric of priming response latencies, since that distribution is a little different than the response latency distributions. And what we found is that 80% um, of the samples will have a, a sufficiently narrow confidence interval at 320 people per word. So that's what we defined as our final size. And there were some other considerations here in our study about um, um, you know, the number of correct trials to expect and that kind of stuff. So we can now apply those rules to our study. So what are we going to do? Well, we've selected a thousand stimuli and we're going to show each partition only a smaller portion, about 300 words, once you account for all the non-words that are involved in the study. At the start of the study, every word has an equal probability of being selected. Each participant, the you know, after each one, the sample size is calculated. And once they have reached the minimum sample size, we'll calculate our standard error. We'll continue sampling until it either achieves the goal of the standard error or the maximum sample size. Once either of those criteria have been reached, we'll set the probability of selection to floor and continue sampling until we're done. And so we just kind of go through this process to, to probabilistically select words. Now you can't totally drop them off because you always need a complete set of studies and you don't want all the weird words at the end. So you set the probability low, but not zero. And so here's just a kind of a visual depiction of how our study is going to work. We're using LabJS, which is really great. And we just have a script that reads the data as it's being written and writes out what words should come next based on their probabilities. All right, so let me end here. Our previous data and our other large norming studies can provide us quality estimates for this procedure. We can collect data on multiple stimuli 
by optimizing our sample sizes. By focusing on accuracy and parameter estimate, estimation, we can provide quality data that adequately answers the hypothesis question <laughs> that can be reused and that maximizes the experimenter and participant time and effort, which is really critical. That being said, if you have any questions, please shoot me a message. You can check out the code for this project or check out all of the collaborators who are actually involved in the PSA part of this project.